Hey, welcome to Feed Yourself Lesson 5. We're going to be looking at context this um, today. And we'll just open up with a word of prayer. Father, we just thank you for this beautiful day you've made. We thank you for your love and your grace. We thank you again for your word. Lord, from Genesis to Revelation, open up our eyes and our understanding to what you have said. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, 2 Timothy 3, 16-17 says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, perfect, by the way, means mature. So God wants us to be mature Christians, trained to do what is right. So all scripture is given by God for our benefit. The study of scripture can teach us everything we need to know. That may seem odd, since the society in which the Bible is written is so different from our society. But the differences are on the surface, or cosmetic, if you like. Human nature does not change. God's word still works today, and it will work a thousand years from now if we're still around. The next thing we have to realize is that the Bible contains within itself all the information that is needed to understand it. Many people run to commentaries and try to understand the Bible from them. Now, commentaries have their place, as we will see in a later lesson, but the Bible is its own best commentary. The Bible will explain itself to you under the guidance of the Holy Spirit as you search it out. Someone has wisely remarked, the Bible sheds a lot of light on commentaries. And that's only half a joke, because it's true. We go to the Bible first, and then we look to, to commentaries. So we start and we end with Scripture. Bible helps are only there as helps. We must work on understanding the Scripture for ourselves. Now, as I mentioned in a previous lesson, Bible helps are not part of the infallible Word of God. They are there to help us, but they must always be judged by the Scripture, not Scripture judged by them. Now, a favorite author of mine, Philip Marlowe, who wrote the course 70 Weeks of Daniel that we have available, has said, and I quote, We maintain that it is far better to have no explanation at all of a difficult passage than to accept one that may turn out to be wrong. It is not easy to give up an idea once we have committed ourselves to it. In fact, that which mainly stands in the way of acceptance of fresh light and truth from the scriptures is the strong reluctance of the human mind to surrender opinions already formed. Our opinions are sometimes based on human authority without any question as to the support which can be found for them in the word of God. Our conviction is that Whatever information is essential for the interpretation of any and every passage in Scripture is to be found somewhere in the Bible itself. If that was not the case, the Holy Scriptures would not be able to make the man of God perfect or complete and thoroughly equipped for every good work, as we saw in 2 Timothy. End quote. So over the course of the next few weeks and months, we're going over the keys to understanding the Bible for yourself. And the most important of all of these, however, is to know your context. It has been said that text without context is pretext. So what is the context? Context is the setting in which a verse or selection of verses is found. There is both the near context and the far context. The near context would be the chapter or two or three chapters in front of and behind the verses, under consideration, if you were to read uh, Romans 6.23, for example, the near context would be Romans chapters 4 to 8. The far context would be the entire book, and each book has its own theme, as we'll see later. It would also include considering whether it's a New Testament book or an Old Testament book, the style in which it was written, and how that verse fits into the overall theme of the Bible. So in other words, the far context of our, of our verse of Romans 6.23 would be the entire book of, Revel, of uh, Romans, uh, considering that it's a New Testament book, and how, does, and how it fits in with the Christ-centered theme of the entire Bible. Now, that may sound complicated, but most 
most of it is simply common sense. For example, take 1 Corinthians 11.34. It says, if someone, is, if someone is hungry, he should eat at home, so that when you meet together, it may not result in judgment. New International Version. Now, if we're going to take this verse by itself, we might figure that it's sinful to eat in restaurants or to go to, to a friend's house to eat. Um, and what would happen if we were traveling? Would we have to go hungry until we got home? Nobody would want to go on a holiday for a week if they had to wait till they got home to eat. Of course you say, that's stupid. If that's the case, what does the scripture mean? To find that out, we have to look at the context. In this case, we simply read the entire uh, chapter 11 and discover that Paul is talking about people abusing the communion table. He is not talking about eating in general or even where to eat a normal meal. So by understanding the context, we can understand the true meaning of the verse. See, that's not too complicated. Yet the vast majority of error in the church and the wacky ideas that people spread come simply from not reading verses in context. This is a vital principle. Everything must be considered in its context. Now let's take another example. Proverbs 29.18 Where there is no vision, the people perish. But he that keeps the law, happy is he. Now if you've been a Christian for any time, you've probably heard many messages on the first half of that verse. And probably none on the second half. Often the first half is used as a missionary appeal to show that without vision of the gospel, the heathen will perish. And while that is true and could be a secondary meaning, that is not what the verse is primarily about. For our context, all we have to do is read the second half of the verse. The verse was, is written in such a way that the second half restates what the first half was saying, but just in a different way, and that's called a parallelism. So what the verse is saying, if you look at the just the entire verse, um, is that if you have a vision of the law, you will not perish and you will be happy. Now that's not teaching salvation by law or by works, but it's showing that if we don't follow God's plan for life, his law, we will end up in trouble. The main reason why Western society is breaking down and may be totally destroyed in the future is because the people and the governments have lost their vision of God's law. Unfortunately, the church has lost that for a large degree as well. And we cover this, study that more in detail in our Lifeline email course. Now let me take one more example. 1 Corinthians 10.23 says, All things are lawful for me, but all things are not expedient. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. Now, is Paul saying that he can commit murder, adultery, and other sins, and that's okay? Now, some people have taken it like that. Yet, if you look at the context, that cannot be what he's saying. In the near context, which is the rest of chapter 10, he's talking about living a life pleasing to God, and how God brought judgment on Israel for their rebellion. In the far context, looking at throughout the New Testament itself, Jesus compared lust to adultery, so obviously he wasn't approving of it. Uh, in Romans, Paul asks and then answers the same type of question. Shall we go on sinning so that grace may abound? By no means. Very emphatic. Romans 6.1 So when you see the near and far context, it's obvious that Paul in 1 Corinthians 10.23 cannot be saying that it's okay to sin. What was Paul saying? The New International Version puts it this way. In quotation marks, everything is permissible. Unquotation marks. But not everything is beneficial. From this we see that Paul was quoting somebody. The first part, everything is permissible, is a quote from somebody who was misunderstanding what Paul's teaching on, on grace was. And then the second part is Paul's answer to that. And there, his correcting of their misunderstanding. So you see, when you look at the context, you know that the first reading of the verse, your first impression, could not be the right one because it would contradict the other context. So context is vital. We can never take a verse just by itself. Not only must scripture verses be considered in context, but also subjects have to be considered in context. Sometimes we take a subject or a topic and only use a few scriptures to define it. When we're studying a topic, and we'll learn how to do that later on, 
we have to consider the entire teaching of Scripture on that subject and look for how each piece works together to form a complete teaching. The hot topic of divorce is an excellent example. Many Christians take their total view on divorce from Matthew 5.32 or Matthew 19.9 without consideration for the complete teaching of Scripture. We have to look at the entire teaching of Scripture, not just one or two verses. And we'll learn how to do that subject study later on in this course. So context is vital in understanding Scripture. Never assume you know what a single verse or even a selection of verses mean by themselves. Always look at and consider the context. This is the golden rule of Scripture interpretation, and I'm going to remind you of it from now until the end of the course. Context, context, context. All methods of Bible study depend on it, and errors abound if we ignore it. A person can prove anything they want from Scripture if they ignore the context. Here's a far-out example for you. But, if you want to use Scripture out of context, you can prove suicide's acceptable. Read Matthew 27, 5, which, said, which says Judas went out and hanged himself. Then you follow that by leading, reading the last half of verse of Luke 10, 37. Jesus said, Go thou and do likewise. Now, of course, such an interpretation is totally foolish. And yet, how many wacky ideas float around through Christianity because people use Scripture out of context? They never even consider. They quote a verse, never even think about its, its home, its context. Uh, even Satan knows how to use Scripture. Uh, check out Matthew 4 and Luke 4, his temptation of Christ. He quoted Scripture to Jesus Christ himself. He knows it far better than we do. After all, he's been studying it ever since it was written. And he takes it out of context to manipulate it for his own purposes. And his servants do the same thing. So always, always check out the context of a verse. Whether it's coming from the pulpit, whether it's a friend that's saying it, whether it's your own uh, Bible study, always look for context. What does it mean in the context in which it was said? Very important, vital. So our project for week five is day one tomorrow, Read Ephesians chapter 5, verse 14 by itself. Don't read any other verses. Just look at that one verse and write a short paragraph on what you think it means. Then read the whole book of Ephesians once. Only six chapters won't take you very long. Day two, read the whole book of Ephesians once. Again. Day three, read Ephesians chapter 1 and chapters 2 twice. And then write a short paragraph about each one, about what that chapter is about. Day 4, read Ephesians 3 and 4, and summarize each chapter in a short paragraph again. Day 5, read Ephesians 5 and 6, and summarize a short paragraph for each chapter, what it, that chapter is about. And then on day 6, read Ephesians chapter 5 four times. Day 7. Answer the following questions about Ephesians 5.14, where you started. What is the context, or what is chapter 5 talking about? What is the far context talking about? And in this case, just consider the book of Ephesians. What is the book of Ephesians about? Take a look at the summaries that you wrote on the previous days. Then, considering the near and the far context, what do you think the meaning of Ephesians 5.14 is? Is it the same as you originally thought? Perhaps it is. Perhaps now, with studying the context, you see it in a little different light. But take a look at it and see. Is the meaning exactly what you thought it was to start with or not? And that's a good exercise for you to do. Just go through Ephesians, take a look at it, understand it, understand the context, and, and see how the context applies to that verse. And then, of course, continue on with your daily reading program. We will just close again with our number 6, 24 to 26 blessing. And then we'll be ready for next week. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord turn his face towards you and give you peace. Have a great week and we'll be back next week with Lesson 6 when we'll look at context again in a slightly different uh, perspective. Have a great week.